I am so sorry I missed, I missed my time with you all yesterday. I was absolutely crushed, and it was completely outside of my control. So thanks for that one, Mark. That makes me feel so much better. I stayed in a super creepy hostel, and it was, it was a Lord of the Rings-like quest. So I am super stoked that so many people came to, to, to talk, to listen to, to Security at Developer Conference. And this just, it makes my heart happy. So just know that you've made like my week and my month, and I just, I just appreciate that so much. As Mark has already mentioned, my name is Siren. I apparently don't know how to get to a plane on time, so that, yeah, that's my thing. Um, I hate the word security expert, so I call myself a security enthusiast because I really dig my job and I talk about security a lot. Um, and one, my big passion in, in life is trying to get more people into security no matter what that takes. So if, if it's interpretive dance, if it is cleaning your bathroom, I have literally picked up somebody's dry cleaning. So I, I will go the extra mile, and if it means making an ass of myself to try and get more people into the field that I love so deeply, I, I'm your girl. I'll do it. So that is all you need to know about me. That's my Twitter. I answer questions. My plane is after this, so I'm going to be like booking it out the door. But if you write to me, I usually answer in a somewhat timely fashion. So today's talk, when it decides to switch slides, there we go. Yay! <laughs> Uh, the, the subject of this talk is, is security from an infrastructure perspective, and this talk was born of a frustration of mine because I can't tell people what I do most of the time because most people have absolutely no idea what working with security means. They understand it from a black hat, a DEF CON, a Twitter X, doom bug, blah, blah, blah. They understand it from a compliance and the ISO guy or girl is making my life miserable. They understand it from a newspaper, computer says no, perspective. They understand it from a, we should use encryption and it shouldn't be MD5, but MD5 is the only thing we have and I can't change the keys and if anybody finds out, I'm in deep dark trouble. But everybody knows it's the buzzword and so it sounds super, super cool. And they also know that working with security people tends to be a pain in the ass because our job, from a lot of people's perspective, my job is to say no. And so most people, when I come to any workplace, I am met with a sigh and a rolling eyes and a do I have to, and that sucks. And it sucks for me and it sucks for everybody that I know that works in security, and so I'm here from a desperate plea from my brothers and sisters in the trenches of please love us and please let us love you. Because we are all in this together and it hurts me personally to be met with that from that perspective. And so I was, I've been thinking a lot about like, why is that? And I realized it, it comes down to a lot of myths. Most people don't actually know what day-to-day -day security work is. They don't. And so it comes back to the idea of intangibility. Because if you ask the CEO, if you ask a project manager, somebody you know, who, who has to talk PR, their question is going to be, how secure are we? And they're talking to engineers who do not like intangible things that they cannot measure and security is an intangible thing. I cannot ever say, we are 100% secure, we are in hackable. Because I don't know. My job is to guess. I am a very, well, I am, I am a moderately paid, recently unemployed guesser. I'm an educated guesser, but I guess. And so I wanted to talk about this from an infrastructure perspective, not a tool perspective, not a code perspective. I wanted to talk about it from the perspective of impact in a retrospective. So I wanted to talk about one of the great engineering marvels, the Titanic. This was one of engineering's success stories. I'm not kidding. So everyone has heard of the Titanic. Hands up if you have not. Excellent. We're starting from the same point. How many of you have heard the Titanic described as unsinkable? Hand up. Was it the engineers that built the HMS Titanic that described her as unsinkable? No. They described her as practically unsinkable. Now, why is this interesting? So when the Titanic was built, she was built by a company called Harlan and Wolf, and she was an Olympic-class cruising ship. And the White Star, which owned her, was in a, in a fade with their main competitor, which was a company called, and I'm probably saying this wrong, but I'm going to go with Cunard, and this is being filmed, so if it's wrong, ugh, sorry. Um, and so they were competing against one another for who could build the luxury ship to get from Europe to the United States in style. And so the Titanic was 
their, you know, it was their thing and they got her out the fastest. And this becomes really, really interesting because if we look at startups and lean and agile and break, you know, move fast and break things, it is first to market. So we're going to look at the Titanic from a retrospective perspective. So we're going to kind of walk through her and we're going to see what we did. So Titanic suffers just like I currently suffer and my brothers and sisters in arms currently suffer from a lot of myths. So the Titanic was built in her day by the absolute brightest engineering core there was. She was an absolute engineering mar marvel. She had four elevators on board. She had a parent clock child relationship. So if the captain changed the time in his parent clock, all of the other clocks on board would actually sync up to the parent clock that the captain had. She had elevators. She had machines that turned steam into drinkable water. She was an absolute engineering spectacle. And her crowning achievement was her Morse code. And at the time, Morse code was brand new, it was a brand new protocol, and they could communicate ships to ship from about 100 to 150 miles. That was the absolute max they could do. Titanic, she could communicate 500 miles during the day to 2,000 miles at night. Super cool. Now, for the rest of this, I want you to imagine yourself as a developer or you know, an, a, a Titanic engineer. Everybody in this room thinks that's pretty cool if they don't know what happens. There's not a person in the room that wouldn't be like, wow, that's super cool, because you don't know what's gonna happen. And so they've looked at the Titanic, and one of the things that has impressed the people, and this is William Banks, he was the person that did a few of the Titanic memorials. His comment when he was looking at the engineering charts of the Titanic was the fact that the calculations were so accurate. She was amazingly well done. And she met and exceeded all of the compliance and all of the security regulations of the day. All of them. Exceeded. Now this becomes extra interesting because she was also the new model. She'd been let into production first. They'd won the speed wars. So this is the way you used to build bulkheads before. And on the bottom we see the Titanic, and that is how her bulkheads were built, and the bulkheads are the things at the bottom of the boat that help keep the boat afloat. And so she had bulkheads that were next to one another, and they were open bulkheads, and they were built in a flat model, which means that she could have a lot more space for paying passengers, and a lot more space for entertainments. You know, I could waltz, and I could Rose and Jack, and on the door, and all that crap. And her walls were thinner. So then we're gonna look at her procedures. And during this time, everybody knew that icebergs were a thing, but they were considered a menace. But they weren't, you know, iceberg, what is that? Everybody knew that they were a thing. So you're looking for icebergs, at which point the guy that's in the crow's nest realizes that the binoculars that he has to see the icebergs are actually locked in the crow's nest and the guy that had the keys had quit and left a few days before. Not an issue, they said. Icebergs are a menace, but we're not actually worried about this thing. And the PR company, White Star, that owns the shipping line says she is unsinkable. Not a worry, so off they set sail. As she launches, her three turbine engines are so powerful that she almost sinks immediately from her own backdraft. She is also a little bit unwieldy, so she rips out the moorings from the tugboat that's pulling her out. The captain takes responsibility, and off they go. Now, everybody in here, we're engineers, we're on the Titanic, none of you would be worried because all these things are handleable, right? No one in here would be like, I'm doomed. Because those are small, handleable issues. Nobody's died yet. Icebergs weren't a thing. So I mentioned this awesome, super cool Morse code way further. The direct result of that, which had been highly publicized at a time, was that they had two people that were on board doing the Morse code. All of the passengers thought this was badass. So these two guys, and they were hardcore radio engineer freaks. They were, they were like, you know, they were cutting edge dudes. They spent all of their time dealing with the passengers, just chattering and sending these stupid passenger messages back and forth, and they were tired. So 11.40, the Californian says to the Titanic, hey, we're stopped. There's lots of ice going on. And the Titanic says, shut up, dude, we're tired. Go away. Now, all of us in this room knows what happens, and we'd be thinking, ah, but they should have, and no. 
because you've spent your entire day doing some grunt work task that you definitely did not get in the role description. If you're a developer, you are not in it for the maintenance or support. You're doing cutting edge, whatever it is. It is not sending a customer's or a passenger's, hi mom, I'm having super fun on the Titanic. We've all had that type of word. And now you've done this all day. You're not gonna panic at this message, you're not. So the passengers were super excited about this. So did this message receive anything? Not really. So what happens? They run right into an iceberg. Now that message, the shut up dude, they ran into an iceberg an, an hour later. Now, they run into an iceberg. Now they've seen the iceberg, and you'd think they knew icebergs at the time were a thing. Hand up if you think they had a routine in place for what to do when you're almost on top of an iceberg because they saw it way too late. Hand, there's one brave dude. You're my favorite dude, dude. Nope, they didn't. So they had no idea what to do, so they decided we're gonna go hard to port. So they try and turn the ship to avoid running into the iceberg. Now there's a great myth said the captain was speeding, he was gonna beat the speeding record. No, he was not speeding. He had actually gone on a more southerly route because he knew the iceberg things were a thing, so he had actually course corrected and slowed down. He was en route, he had he taken the warning seriously. Now, he had said to the officer on watch that if it becomes misty and it'll make seeing the icebergs harder, wake me up. But it was a very clear evening. So they had absolutely nothing that said this would be a problem. So they go hard to port and the iceberg runs along the side of the ship and rips up the side of the ship. It's pretty bad. Now, do you remember those open bulkheads, those super cool modern open bulkheads that every single ship had? So here we go, we have the Morse code, and this is super cool. This is, they've actually maintained, and it's down here at the bottom if you like, if you like signal chatter and you're interested. This is the real conversation. So she's smashed into the iceberg here at the top, and this is the Titanic, and she's calling out to every ship in the area via Morse code. And she calls twice, and there are two ships that answer her after this, after this second call at 12.17, and they are too far away to help her. And so by 1221, the Carpathia answers the Titanic, and this is their real response. They don't know what SMS means, or SMS, or they don't know what CQC, which was the SOS of the time. They have absolutely no idea what's going on, so they're just annoyed that they keep getting all these messages. Because SOS and distress calls had not been standardized. Now, They've run along the port side of the ship, they've ripped up the side of the ship, and they have these open bulkheads. Now they can start shutting the bulkheads, but it takes almost a minute before they do. And they're out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of nowhere. And it has to be a person that starts the manual process of shutting down these bulkheads, and they've ripped up the side of the ship, so it's already too late. Now the captain realizes we have an actual issue, so he sounds a very small alarm, and he starts getting people to the lifeboats. Unfortunately, the lifeboat drill the day before had been canceled, and the engineers who were manning the lifeboats had absolutely no idea if the lifeboats had ever been tested, and so they launched them half full, because they are afraid they are going to sink. They also do not inform any of the passengers that aren't on the first deck that there is a problem until far too late. So most people don't even realize that there's a problem. They try to signal for help. These are the rules that they should follow to signal for help. The, uh, the Titanic fired eight rockets of a battery of 36. There were two ships that were close by and they thought the Titanic was having a party. <laughs> yes. So then we're gonna go to leadership because we all know nobody cared and that's not true. The captain was doing the right thing. He went down with his ship, he was memorialized, and he got a bronze star. He died, he went down with his ship, he did the right thing. This guy owns the White Star Lines, villainized by the press, absolutely villainized. He was telling the captain to beat the speeding record. He was, ah, blah, 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 it's his fault. He lived. The only reason he lived is he was forced onto a half-full boat, half-full lifeboat, after he realized there was nobody else that he could put on the boat. 
He was devastated and he was tarred and feathered by the press at the time that was owned by the competitor. This is what you believe to this day. Now, interestingly about those lifeboats, everyone thinks the Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats. Lifeboats at the time, there were enough lifeboats on the, on the Titanic to meet and exceeded all the compliance regulations. It was per gross weight of the boat, had nothing to do with the number of people on the boat. She had four more lifeboats than she needed to, and they were following the rules of the day. Which brings us to today. So we've gone through half of our retrospective, and now we're gonna look at how we have improved since she sank, and I'm gonna go with 1912 or 1914. I'm, my numbers are failing me, but it's one of those two. We've clearly learned we don't do this anymore. We launch the minimum viable product which lives up to none of the compliance of the day. And we launch it with real people's data on it. And we inform them nothing. And even better, we make sure that when we're working on our networks, we know what micro-segmentation is. We understand that we shouldn't have one big flat network. Everyone understands that it shouldn't be one big open bulkhead. So we understand that north to south traffic, the traffic coming in from the client to the server, that shouldn't be just like an open bus lane, but east to west traffic, that is from the developers talking to internal services, internal services talking to themselves, guess where most denial of service attacks come from? It's inside the house. Now interestingly, we have a lot of automatic controls, there are a lot of tools that can help you do this automatically, but they require somebody who understands what they mean and they require somebody to, just like in the Titanic, shut those automatic locks. How fast will you actually react? Not fast enough, if you even understand that you're in trouble. And looking at the Titanic, they didn't. They had absolutely no idea. They hit the iceberg and they were like, uh, oops. And that sounds like something they should have known. Here I am at my job. And this is who we're preparing for. I bought this photo just so I could use it because I think it's hilarious. He's pointing a gun. It looks like either at a like paper or at the person. I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but I love this photo because when it's, it's security people and it's hackers, it's always like, I just love this. We know that hackers and security issues are out there, but if your company is attacked or if you have a security problem within your company or even, you know, we're doing agile, all teams are responsible for everything. We, you know, we, no, rules are nothing. Everyone should do everything themselves. How many people in here would know what to do? Hand up. I rest my case. Okay, the one brave goat, second favorite dude. Very brave, sir, very brave. But not, never fear. We can read all of the stuff. We have all of the times we will be empowered. Unfortunately, deadlines are a real thing. And so here you have your boss, you have your whatever it is, and the deadline is always a thing. Do you have time to learn an area which is mysterious and difficult? and one that has, let's put it bluntly, an image problem. You don't, not realistically. If you have to, you know, eat the entire elephant all by yourself. And so our defense, and this is my defense, and this is all of our defense, is that we are smart people and it will never happen to us because we don't have whatever it is, which is why I only wear my seatbelt on those days I intend to crash my car. Yes. So then we go to leadership because it is so easy to say that the company does not care about security. So here I am at work. Yeah, that's me. I love the story of Sisyphus, but my job, security's job is to help people make intelligent choices. I am a professional guesser. People cannot make choices if they do not understand the impact of those choices. And one of the biggest failings within security is that we are poor at adding people to the conversation. We are phenomenally bad at making people feel like they're invited, which means that the reputation of both companies that have security issues, which are understandable in context, what happened to the Titanic is understandable, given that they were making the best choices they had with the information available. But how do we treat companies that have security problems that come out in the media today? They're idiots, they don't care, blah, blah, blah. I would never do that and I only wear my seatbelt on those days I crash my car. Most people have this response, and we can see it in the media, and we can see it in Twitter, which means that most security people live in absolute terror of the day that something bad happens to their company, and it is an impact that they could not change, but they will be blamed. 
And so this is probably a little darker than what you were expecting from a keynote. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's a little darker. You're like, wow, this is just, she's just ranting and raving and how it's all, you know, poor security. And that is absolutely not my point. Because things have gotten better than that Titanic. I was talking to Mark earlier and I said the first time I talked at DevOps, which was a few years ago, almost nobody came. And there was no security track. And the, the places you heard about security was at security conferences where you get to talk to people that agree with you. And everyone sits in the audience and goes, yes, she's completely right. Yeah, it's great. Very empowering. But the thing is, we need a diversity of voices within the security industry. We do. We absolutely do because my discipline is one of context. And the more people that understand what I am saying, the more we can talk to one another in an intelligent manner. And an intelligent manner means that we will be making intelligent choices together. And so by the very fact that I'm standing here babbling and none of, none of you have like thrown tomatoes at me and you're all still here means that things are getting better because we can make intelligent choices together. It is the diversity of opinion and the diversity of thought that means that we have improved since the Titanic. Because looking at the Titanic, Titanic is the reason that we have lifeboats that are the same number of passengers on the boat. It is the reason that boats that are carrying passengers must be in eyesight from one another. It is terrible that all of those people died, but we learn from those choices. Security will improve, and you will improve your knowledge of security by being here, by listening to this talk. So see this as the uplifting message it actually is. The fact that we are here having this conversation in a positive manner means that we have learned. And so if you take nothing away from this, take this, that I am deeply grateful to be here, and that I truly appreciate your willingness to listen, and it is our willingness to listen to each other that means that Titanic will be the positive learning experience with hopefully less death in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>